Hello and welcome to another one of the podcasts. Here we go. Uh, this is Hugh over here in Gloucestershire and Phil down there in London town. There he is, waving somewhere. <laughs> now, we're, we're going to hit a big number today. This is this is number three in colorimetry. Why are we coming back to colorimetry? Well, because as Phil was just saying a few moments ago off, off, off camera, a lot has changed, or enough has changed, to make us uh, re-evaluate what we talked about before and maybe add a few more things to it. So, Phil, perhaps you'd like to uh, fill us in on what's been going on and let's talk about some colorimetry three. Yeah, well, I, I suppose if, 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 you, um, if you spin back, it's, it's a couple of years now, actually, uh, we did... No! We did a, yeah, 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 a, a mechanics of colour sort of 101, um, which went through human vision. Uh, that was a, nearly an hour's worth of... No, no, yeah, nearly an hour's worth of, of, of how people see colour and how all that works. And then we did another one, uh, calibrating monitors for television. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and how, how uh, you get monitors in, in the correct uh, uh, setup, correct calibration, for accurately displaying TV colour. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and to be honest, that's as far as I would have been happy to go because... Uh, from my point of view, I'm a, I'm a TV engineer. You, you know that's what I do. I don't really get involved that much with film. Um, not not something I'm I'm, I'm really into. Um, but increasingly, uh, there's been something uh, on the horizon um, uh, to do with um, uh, using domestic displays in grading rooms. So, um, uh, just let me stop you there because that, t- to the old school, would be an absolute anathema. How would how would it have been possible for those that, that spent a lot of time with CRTs and well, it, ducked out before um, yeah, I, else came in? I, I suppose you know in the eighties and the nineties, you basically um, a, 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 a display suitable for grading in in TV terms would have been something that was that had what we would have called EBU phosphors, yeah, um, so that the uh, the whites and the blacks um, would. Uh, um, you know, rendered the correct colour. I've just I've just found the, uh, an EBU technical document from 1975 that talks about um, uh, you know how to uh, uh, about the CCIR um, uh, colour standards. You know, with 6500 uh, uh, Kelvin as the white point, that you know that that particular kind of uh, white as, as the white point, and 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 how that relates on the XY axes of a CIE 1931 chromaticity chart. And, uh, and and to be honest, you don't really need any of that for domestic television. So long as domestic televisions are reasonably, you, you know, they can display a reasonable gamut of colours, and you, you know, blacks are blacks, and whites are whites, and colours are colours, then you're good. But that doesn't work if if you're if you're in a grading room where you know, the director of photography or the producer are expecting to see very much more precise renditions of the colour they saw on set or the colour they saw when the film was being transferred in the telecine suite or or however it went and uh, and 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 so the, the 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 understanding was you had a domestic television maybe in the back of the grading room but the understanding was that was a domestic television that's probably what the people at home are going to see but we're working to a greater standard we're working to the standard that the guy in the broadcast QC booth will be looking at when he accepts yeah. this recording um and and so that yeah you're very that's exactly right that that, that was the distinction uh, but for a long time, and and it's really with with the with the Panasonic uh, Viera plasma um, televisions, um, uh, they had enough tweakability in them um, to allow you to um, uh, properly set them up so that blacks were the correct color, whites were the correct color, and all the things you'd expect of. Of a display that was meant to show accurate television colour, and, and so for a long time they've been the second display in grading rooms. They've been the one by the client sofa at the back of the room, because, because that was always the uh, the trap. You never wanted two colour sets because the client would go, "Oh, I prefer the colour on that one." And of course, you can never match the two. Exactly. Always- Which one should I be looking at? Kind of thing. That yeah. was, you know, and, yeah. and no colourist wants to be dealing with that. Uh, uh, but but the Panasonic Vieras, the fifty-five inch Panasonic Vieras, I forget the model number, had enough tweakability in it and enough gamut to be able to get it to really very closely match the BVM at the front of the room, the Sony, you know, grade one, twenty thousand pound monitor at the front of the room, be that an OLED or an LCD or a, or a CRT, going back five years. Yeah. Um, uh, however, you can't buy plasmas anymore. Well, only on eBay. Um, uh, so they, they can't buy them new anymore. And so a lot of colorists say, well, what do we use as our, as our second monitor now? These OLEDs look as if they might have a good good enough range. Uh, are they any good? 
And so I was approached by a well-known facility who who you used to run engineering for. In fact, you used to run Molinaire, did. didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were the top man there. So I was MD for a while. Um, and, 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 and they've been wanting to know, can we use this certain model of OLED? Um, yeah, and a very nice high-end domestic set, £2,000 set. Can we use that as the second display? And so I've been doing a bit of work with them, a bit of experimenting to find out oh, just how well we can do that. Now, the, my first visit, I went and uh, calibrated the thing as close as I could to uh, the, the BVM using the, the, the techniques we would have described in, in po- podcast number two on colour. Uh, and I thought I got it pretty close. Um, I, uh, I, I, th- 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 that, that television only had tweaks in the whites. It didn't have any tweaks in the blacks. But it did have various preset modes, dynamic, cinema, gaming modes. And I went through those and I found one of them. I think it was dynamic two or warm to, or something like that, which the blacks were pretty <laughs> blinking close. And I and so I got the whites correct. And to be honest, if you weren't somebody who was used to looking at colour displays, you'd have been hard pushed to see the difference between that and the BVM. If the two of them were separated by more than a few metres, you wouldn't remember the difference looking between them. But the colourist, who's got a real eagle eye, yeah, he immediately spotted. He said, no, I can, I can see that one's a tiny bit more magenta in the blacks than that one. It's pretty close, but no cigar. Um, and the clients will notice, so we can't do that. So he suggested, in fact, it's something we've been thinking of for a while. Why don't we put a LUT in the way? Okay. You, you yeah. just, What's a LUT then? Just remind everybody. We well, did talk about them. But. That, that's a LUT. <laughs> that's a Fuji IS Mini, so that's a LUT if you really kind of want to know. Uh, but well, yeah, I mean, that tells you nothing, does it? A LUT, L U T, lookup table, is something that transforms one set of values into another set of values. So typically, for a long time, we had what we called look, uh, 1D LUTs, one dimension lookup tables. And all a 1D LUT is, is it's three. Um, sets of numbers that tell you how to transform the reds from what they are coming down the cable as a Rex 709 HDSDI signal. How do I transform those numbers into numbers that will force the monitor to display those numbers correctly? Yeah. Uh, and I've got a column for reds, a column for greens, a column for blues. And if we're working with 10-bit video, which we are, that's 1,024 for the reds. And so it's about 3,000 numbers that are required. Tiny amount of data, you know, in modern terms. Three, three 1,000 bytes long um, uh, tables in database terms, I suppose. Uh, and, and that's great. And you get 1D LUTs built into monitors, and, and, and yeah, they're quite common. But what a 1D LUT doesn't do for you is that it doesn't tell you anything about whether there's any interaction between the reds, the greens, and the blues, if there's any crosstalk, ha- how closely coupled the reds, the greens, and the blues are. Now, the reason why uh, LUTs have been so prominent in the film world is because on a piece of celluloid film, the the, the, the layers of ink, the layers of, of pigments are very tightly coupled, yeah. you, you know, because they sit one on top of the other. What the red layer does... Actually, it's not the red layer, is it? It's, it's, it's CMYK colour space. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so what one layer does very much affects the other layer and, and, and vice versa. And so as the, as, as, as the reds change, I'm not going to say uh, signs, magenta, and yellows. I'm, I'm going to refer to them as, because that's the transformation that happens when the film's yeah. digitised. Um, but as the reds change, the greens and the blues are very much affected by the changes in the red and vice versa. And so consequently, a 1D LUT just doesn't cut the mustard. It doesn't provide the accurate modelling of what's going on. So if you say, I've got my my nice Sony BVM monitor calibrated to Rec. 709 so that it's good for television work, but actually we're grading a film and we want our monitor to look, look more like uh, Kodachrome stock whatever or, mm-hmm. or, or Fuji uh, you know, stock whatever. We want it to look like the film it's going to be written back out onto um, in the ARRI laser at the end of the process. Therefore, we want a lookup table in the way that transforms our Rec. 709 numbers into something that emulates the film stock. That was always the traditional use of a 3D LUT. Now, the thing to think about a 3D LUT is that a 3D LUT is a it's a, it's a, it's conceptually a cube. It's it's a thousand by a thousand by a thousand uh, pieces yeah. of data. So that's that's a thousand. That's a million. That's a gigabit. That's a, a gigabyte of or 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 a, a billion values. And each one of those values is not just a value. It's a transform. It's a one D LUT. So it's a thousand by a thousand by a thousand one D LUTs. So you know, multiply that all out, and that's thirty terabytes of data. 
that doesn't fit into a box that big that costs less than a thousand pounds. You know, that requires hard drives and, and pokey computers and things like that. It doesn't fit into something that only has flash memory. So the common um, uh, the commonly accepted way of doing this is that you don't check. You don't, when you build your LUT, you don't check every thousand positions. You check a subset of that. And so we typically deal with 17-point LUTs. And what that means is we, we, we take 17 points along the red axis, 17 points along the green, 17 points along the blue. You multiply that all up, and you've got about 5,000 dots within your matrix to deal with. Uh, and and it turns out that actually uh, that scales pretty nicely. You know, if you if you interpolate between the dots, uh, that works quite nicely. You know, that, that's kind of good enough for most applications. And so you wind up with uh, a data set that allows you to take your well-defined color space, Rec. 709, and transform it into something else. Up until a year ago, that was always the look of a film stock. But nowadays, as people are starting to say, can't we use this two thousand pound domestic television in our in our in our TV workflow? Can we tame this television to make it conform exactly to Rec. Seven Hundred Nine? Uh, and if you haven't got a, a plasma, it's kind of a hard work. It's you know, it's a big ask kind of thing. But with a LUT in the way, uh, you can start doing some interesting things. And, and, and interestingly, uh, AJA, whose website I have up on screen at the moment, they have a, a LUT box of their own, uh, which can store two 3D LUTs internally, so you can flip between them for reference purposes. You can say, that's that and that's that, for only £500, just a mere £500. And it's very similar to the one I've got here. I've got a Fuji one here. This one's a bit more elaborate because this does other things. But typically you have uh, an SDI input, um, which you can see there. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then you have uh, an SDI and an HDMI output. So, so this is the ideal okay. box for, for taking uh, that high-end domestic television and taming it, making it behave more like a Rec. 709 display. Um, by by profiling this display, as the process is called, and then, and then taking that profile data and building a lookup table to make Rec. 709 digits, numbers coming down the cable, make them into numbers that will light up the television in the way that the Rec. 709 numbers should have them light up the television. Yeah, it's a bit of a crude explanation. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, so, so the, the first thing it's worth pointing out is that you can't. So, so the, in our in our uh, you know, calibrating monitors podcast, we we talked a lot about the kind of probes you use. And at the time, I was using a DK uh, series probe for LCDs and a Philips PM fifty six thirty nine probe for um, CRTs. Now they're kind of com complete units. It's a it's a handheld piece that does the measurements for you, and it's a and it's a probe that you stick on the front of the monitor. And so th th that's a that, that you know you can't get any data out of that. It allows you to read colours, but it doesn't allow you to build lookup tables and so the thing the, the, the kind of probe that's kind of largely replacing those kind of old handheld probes is is the thing I've got up on screen at the moment a Klein KT10 uh, and although if you remember from the original um, uh, Colour Industry podcast we talked a bit about the difference between spectral radiometers and yeah. uh, photometers and the, the the reason why people were typically schlep brand with three different photometers because each photometer is set up for the particular uh, metamoristic characteristic of the display technology it's calibrating to. So, so the spectrum of a of a of a CRT can be best detected by a CRT calibrated probe. The spectrum of a, a of an LCD monitor, which really is the spectrum of the backlight of the LCD, is best calibrated with a, a photometer that's been set up, being you know set up for that um, style of display. But um, when we started getting asked to do OLEDs about a year ago, quite a lot, I said, look, we can't just be schlepping around with three big flight cases with probes in. We've got to do something a bit more intelligently. And I talked to a fantastic guy called Steve Shaw at Light Illusion. Yes. Yeah. And, and he said, no, the, the Klein KT10, it's only been out for a few months. Uh, it, although it's a photometer, uh, so it is an RGB tristimulus device, and so should have the failings of your eye it should have the failings of those other technologies. It, I, it should be specific to the the, 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 the the thing that it's calibrating for. They've done a very clever thing. They've matched the metamorphism of the probe, the spectral response of the probe. They've matched to the average person's eye. So, in fact, it fails metamoristically in exactly the same way that your eye fails. So That's good. Yeah, that's good. That, 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 I mean, that, that's kind of insightful, isn't it? And, and so with a client probe, although it's a photometer, it's not a spectral radiometer with the big £25,000 price tag and the hour to warm up and the, you know, all that stuff. Uh, uh, it is um, usable with different display technologies. So I am going to swing my laptop round so you can see what I've got behind me. 
and there is there is my Klein probe, oh, yes. um, uh, with a um, uh, and it's pointing at a, a big big uh, um, Samsung LCD. It's a contemporary model LCD. It's mm-hmm. um, it's uh, it has it's a um, uh, you know a LED backlit backlit uh, um, model, and you can see I've got my Klein probe pointing at the the white patch that's being generated on the display and so the client should be measuring um precisely the color of the white light that's coming off that monitor um and ordinarily i'd be using um uh, again this this fuji little fuji is mini that i showed you before because this this has two functions the is mini it's it's a lut uh, a 3d lut but it's also a patch generator so you'll notice it has a it has a usb connector and uh, you can drive it over the USB to generate whatever colors you want. And, and so you can use it as the device that generates the colors on the monitor. Uh, you know, it can run through all the Rec. 709 colors if you want it to. And then connect it to the same computer, you have your Klein probe. And with a piece of software like um, uh, Lightspace, uh, um, made by Steve's company, uh, um, uh, you can you then got a closed loop, and um, and so I'll, I'll just I've got I've got something else actually generating patches here. So if I if I run through those, you can see I'm I'm changing the color of the patch on the monitor. So they were yeah. they were grays. Now I can go through the primaries and 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 the secondaries. It's not great on this Apple camera, is it? But you, <laughs> but you you get the idea. So let, let me go back to uh, let me go back to a, a, a white patch. Now this is just a domestic monitor, so it's probably a bit blue. It's probably not quite right. And if I go to Chroma Surf which is the application um, uh, we use for just reading off uh, the client probe. And I put my camera feed away uh, so we can actually see what Chromosurf is showing us. Um, put that up there. And if I, I should probably share my screen with you, Hugh, so you can see what I'm banging on about. Um, so, so here's the. This is the client interface, uh, which um, uh, is showing us what's displayed uh, on that monitor, and it, it, it's brutally the same as the kind of thing that your handheld Philips or DK meter would give you. Um, it's giving us a. Uh, there's, there's, you can see that there's the CIE 1931 yeah. chart there, and we can see rather splendidly they've put the black body locus on there for us. So on that line is is all the all the relative mixes of red, green, and blue that we call white. And yep. right there in the centre, on the crosshair, is uh, is 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 is, is illuminant D, uh, 6,500 kelvins, and we've also got a, a measurement of, uh, of 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 luminous intensity. So we've got we're at 100, 105 candelas per meter squared, or, or as the Americans call nits. Um, and in fact, uh, yeah, we can we can see different representations of the color space. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go into a magnified version of the XY color space, and um, you can see now. Uh, that the uh, there's there's the box in the centre. There's the black body yeah. locus, and there's a telling little thing. Although the black black body locus passes through the the centre calibration square, uh, so 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 the four way square here is is supposedly a just noticeable difference. Basically, if the if your dots in there, then the human eye can't tell it from uh, illuminant D. And you'd expect the back black body locus to pass exactly through the centre, wouldn't you? Because you, would. you you know you kind of think TV white should be on the black body locus. But actually, TV white, 6,500 Kelvin, uh, is not quite on the black body locus. It turns out in the 1970s, uh, they realised that they'd, been, they'd got Planck's constant wrong for all those years. And Planck's constant um, actually says that the, 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 white, um, the nearest white point to 6,500 Kelvin on the black body locus is actually 6,504 Kelvin. So, <laughs> so TV, TV white is 6,504 Kelvin, if you want to be tr- strictly accurate. It's so not 6 Kelvin out. Yeah, it's not it's it's not um, it's not exactly what it should be, and that's that's why you see that there. Um, just a little little kind of physics fact there. Um, so that's a that's a four Kelvin difference. Did I get that right? Yes, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you, you know, it's tiny, and and <laughs> if you're ever adjusting a monitor, the merest kind of you know one notch, you know, or the merest movement of a of a of a pot moves you like forty or a hundred Kelvin. You, you know, you can't you can't see four at all. Um, as you'd expect, you know, the, the, the difference is well within the, the just noticeable difference box. Anyway, yeah. you, you'll notice now that, 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 that my, uh, my, um, uh, my monitor there, just down there, uh, is, uh, is showing, as I, as I imagined it would, is showing quite a blue-white. We're quite far off. Um, where we want to be, uh, and and if I if I I bet if I I bet if I scoot through um, the very vari- let's go back to um, just just regular unmagnified uh, chromaticity chart. Um, if I if I scoot through various levels of grey, um, oh look, I mean the colours colour image is changing 
um, as, as we go down through the greys. And in fact, if I go to the primary, if I go to the primary colours, so there's primary red. Uh, I mean, that looks pretty close to the to the apex of the triangle. It's probably a bit out though. And there's there's primary green, which is further into the green. Um, further, it's, it's out of the Rec. 709 gamut, so that's kind of good. You think, well, if the monitor's capable of displaying outside the gamut, we should be able to tame it into the gamut. And, and then blue, again, blue's outside the triangle, so happy days. And then the secondaries, oh, well, so the secondary for cyan is well out. And the secondary for yellow is kind of where you want it to be. And for magenta, again, it's far too blue. So I think the takeaway here is that this, this television, in its native form, is displaying things far too blue. And that's very common, you know. Basically, when they sell these tellies, they want to pop. They want to, to, to be a bit more kind of bluey white, you know. Uh, so no no surprise there. So nowadays, when I'm going to calibrate a broadcast monitor, I'll, I'll, I'll take something that can generate colors and primaries and stuff, and I'll take uh, my Klein probe, and I'll take this bit of software with me on my laptop, and mm -hmm. safe in the knowledge that whatever kind of display technology I come up against, be it a, um, CR an old-school CRT or an LCD or an OLED or even a projector, um, this, this, this probe has... A uh, like a like a, 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 a uh, what do they call it? It's like a um, um, I can't remember the name. It's, it's like a long pipe that, and some aiming lights that allow you to aim it at the projector display in a dark room, and you can calibrate the projector using the same equipment. So that's fantastic. You know, it's kind of it's liberated us. You know, we one shoulder bag. We've we've now got all the kit we need to do any, any display type. You know, and the probe's quite quick and accurate as well. So so it's, it's a real kind of it's really things have really moved on. Um, as far as photometers are concerned. Um, so I'm going to quick chroma surf now because I need to um, uh, use the probe in a different piece of software. Um, no, I don't actually. I've, I've already profiled this monitor. Uh, that, that's by the by. So anyway, um, the good folks at, uh, at Molinaire said, can we profile this OLED display that we've got and um, uh, then turn that profile into a LUT and can we put a LUT in the way to try and tame this beautiful £2,000 OLED we've bought and to use as our secondary display? And I said, well, that's a fantastic idea. So um, uh, I'm just firing up Lightspace, which is um, the more advanced software that you use to make LUTs. And so here's um, uh, Lightspace's version of exactly the same thing. We've got our chromaticity chart. And Lightspace will happily sit there and profile a display. Uh, you know, you, 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 you connect your probe to it. You, can, you make sure that Lightspace can see your nice um, uh, LUT generating box. And, uh, and so long as all, all those things are, are in place, then Lightspace can drive... Oh, I mean, now wants to calibrate the colour emitter. Let's stop that. Lightspace will happily drive the, um, uh, the LUT box to generate coloured patches, and then it will read them back from the probe, and it will build a, uh, a, a Lightspace. So... so um, let me call up a profile I made previously. So there's, here's the profile of that OLED I made at Molinaire. So let's mm -hmm. uh, display that. And you can see that um, you know the two triangles, Rec. 709 and the derived colorimetry of that monitor, almost sit on top of each other. In fact, rather splendidly, the OLED has performed slightly better than Rec. 709 on, on, yeah. on the red-blue axis and about 709 on the other axes. And you can see that we made... So typically, we say... Do make build a 17 point LUT so what you have to do is make 17 measurements along each axis and 17 measurements along each axis for the 17 measurements you're making along the other two axes so we wind up making 17 by 17 by 17 about 5,000 measurements each measurement takes about a second that's how long the probe takes to actually capture the data and make the measurement and so for a 17 point LUT you're looking at about an hour and a half 5,000 seconds approximately yes yeah, three and a half thousand seconds in an hour yeah and 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 so it's kind of off to have a cup of tea and a chat with with Roy, who's the the, the, the chief engineer at Molnair, thoroughly nice bloke, and uh, okay. you know it's all good. Um, some increasingly people are starting to use twenty one point LUTs, which you know sounds like a small difference between seventeen and twenty one, but seventeen cubed and twenty one cubed are really quite different numbers. It's the difference between yeah. an hour and a bit and five hours. Um, people have said to me, "Why don't you just do a, like a one thousand point LUT? You really profile the display, <laughs> work it out. It's about thirty four years." Um, with, with, with a fast probe that can make one measurement per second. So this is why we make 17 or 21 point LUTs. So anyway, there's the, the, there's the colorimetry for the for the uh, set of measurements we made for the OLED uh, that we were dealing with last week. Uh, and yep. so if I then go to um, my color space menu uh, here in here in Light Illusion, Light Space made by Light Illusion, um, 
so I've, imagine I've profiled my monitor and it, it, it would be, just be too tedious to sit here and watch it do it but I mean all it does literally is it, it goes through putting up coloured patches and, mm-hmm. and, and, and making measurements and uh, it's very sort of boring but, but, but it has to be done so uh, we then say we'd like to convert what we've just measured and our conversion is based on we want Rec 709 to be converted for in our case uh, uh, the 6th of February Molinaire OLED um, uh, profile that we just did um, and uh, uh, that, that will then generate a table that says here are all the Rec 709 numbers what do they have to be to display correctly on the, the Molinaire OLED monitor that we've just profiled uh, and there are a few things to consider there's um, there's this little drop down here, peak luma, peak chroma, or fit chroma, um, and it's a bit of an interesting one because when you finish doing the profile, the, the tool reports back to you and it says 98 um, percent of the colours we threw at the monitor were achievable within gamut. So you think, well, that's pretty good, you know, 98 percent. We can display 98 percent of the colours we need to. Well, maybe not so much, but 98 percent is very typical. 99 percent on a good day. Um, but one of the choices you have to make is is this thing here, uh, peak chroma, peak luma, or fit chroma. And what, what that says is, it says, in an instance where, for example, you've got a yellow colour that's gone out of range, how do you want to deal with that? Uh, now, with yellow, because yellow isn't a real colour, it's a secondary colour, you have to turn up the blue to compensate for it. What happens if you're uh, at a point where your blue's already at a maximum? You know, what do you do kind of thing? Um, you could tweak about with the other two colours, but essentially what, what we like to do is we like to we like to choose peak chroma, which says, actually, keep all the chroma values correct and bring the luminance down to bring that peak colour into, into range, which means that the LUT may be producing a slight decreasing in overall luminosity, but that's okay, so long as thing, colours aren't changing. We're okay if things have come down a tiny bit, they're a tiny bit dimmer. We can deal with that. We can turn up the contrast of the monitor again, you, you know. So that's, that's, a, that's the choice you make there. Uh, and, then, and then you literally, um, you create a, 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 a LUT. And there is a colour space conversion reports 98% within target gamut. So what it's telling us is that that, that OLED monitor can achieve about a 98% colour accuracy. We think, oh, that's rather good. Um, yeah. Now, if we go and look at the, um, there are several ways we can look at this transform here. Um, we can look at what they call a 1D view, and that's basically showing us the the, the, the gamma of those three colour channels with, with also the luminance, the derived luminance gamma in there as well. And mm-hmm. kind of stuff's kind of gone a bit awry in the blacks, and it's kind of not tracking that well in the midpoints, and it's kind of not what you want for a television display, is it? This is, fur- this is further shown by, if we look at the 3D cube, and this is really quite interesting because we can spin this around and have a look at things. <laughs> and I don't know how, how fast that's moving for you, Hugh. I'll, I'll, I won't move it very quickly. See. But, uh, cool. but uh, the thing that really bit us in the backside with this monitor, which I, if I put it there, you'll really notice, is the performance in the uh, magenta end of things. So opposite green, so the green magenta line, um, so, so that axis there. So in the very dark parts of the picture, i.e. low green, uh, magenta colours weren't rendering very well. And amazingly, even after we'd done the LUT and we'd loaded this 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 um, uh, this transform into the LUT box, and we're now feeding pictures via it, which for my money made them a little bit better. Again, the colourist was still able to spot that 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 kind of hole in the uh, in the magenta end of the, of, of the calibration. And, uh, you know, all power to him. And in fact, if we spin around there, we can see that the yellows aren't too clever either. Yeah. And, and, and so there's, it's, it's worth pointing out a few things here. Let's, let's see where we can see an edge clearly. Uh, so that there's the, um, the again, there's, uh, that's, the, that's the green axes there. Uh, basically, if we, we counted up these dots along the axes. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's, this, that's where the 17 point LUT is. That's where that, yeah. you know, so 17 by 17 by 17. That derives a, uh, a cube. And basically, the position of each point of the cube in here tells us how much work the LUT's going to have to do to get that colour back to where it needs to be. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a sort of a, a splendidly visual representation of, of just kind of how good <coughs> a, a typical domestic television is. You know, if that was a Sony BVM it monitor... It's surprising. I, I'm very surprised, quite impressed, actually. Yeah. I mean, you, you wouldn't know it just by looking at the, the CIE representation of it. Um, but... Um, 
If that was a broadcast monitor, we would expect perfectly straight sets of dots along each edge. You know, the numbers come in, they come out of the, as the right light levels. But a domestic television, the numbers come in and it's a different story. And a lot of that is down to the fact that you've got all this kind of um, you know, dynamic mode and, uh, and sort of modes where the overall colour balance of the picture changes with the picture content. Uh, you, you know, in dynamic blacks where, where the television is doing crazy thing with the black levels of the picture if, if you've got certain levels of colour in the picture. And, and so when I, when I start um, with a monitor or with a television that I've got to make work for, for, for a professional application, the first thing I do is I go through and I turn off all those modes true pixel TM, you know, or clear colour TM. I turn all of that off. MPEG processing all goes off because I just want a monitor that is as brutally honest as possible and isn't putting any of that nonsense in the way. And then you stand a chance of getting somewhere close to where you want to be. Now, this has to be said is probably the best example of a domestic television I have seen so far short of a Panasonic Viera, a Panasonic Viera Plasma. Um, I did, uh, uh, Corinne, one of the engineers at there. she did provide us with a, a Panasonic LCD, and that was terrible by comparison with this. Um, so I, I think it's kind of all to play for at the moment, you know. We've got, dis- we've got displays that have got big holes in them, and uh, <coughs> if they're going to be used for semi, semi-pro applications, even with a LUT in the way, you can't, you can't get from there to there. You know, there just isn't the dynamic range in the monitors to do it. And that's where that 98% comes in, you know. Actually, if you're shy of 100%, you're probably not going to be doing a very good job. Having said that, though, I'd have been happy to put that monitor in uh, in an edit suite. It really was really very close for most applications. And it was only a bit, a bit of bad um, magenta performance in the blacks that, that put the colorist man off. Um, it wasn't it wasn't so horrendous. So, so I suppose the view you get from um, the LUT, looking at that... Is is it really exaggerates the bad parts, you know, and that's not so horrible kind yeah. of thing. Now, if I go back to, I've got some some screen grabs of the other monitors I did on the day. Uh, I'm just stuck on my blog, so um, there's the th- that that one there you can see there. That's the that's the OLED uh, which we've just been spinning yeah. around. This one here is a Panasonic Viera LCD. Oh, just look at that. That's awful, isn't it? You know, it's not. It, it's not getting anywhere near. The, the, the gamut it needs to be in for proper TV work. But, you know, they're flying off the shelves at, at PC World Curries, you know. Um, Good gracious, you're hardly getting your money's worth there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that, 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 that's, uh, that's the truth of the matter. So we go back to light space. So, so having, having built this LUT, um, we can now export this. Um, uh, and b- rather brilliantly, light space has this feature whereby you can... It supports multiple different LUT formats. And you look through here, there's all the kind of, all the things you'd expect, ARRI, Autodesk, Avid, you know, all the things that support LUTs. Um, <coughs> Light Illusion can export those formats, Da Vinci, the Dolby Monitor, um, etc. And you think, oh my word, what, what kind of LUT do I need? You know, but if you go select all and give it a name and export it, it basically builds you a LUT in every possible format. <laughs> And it takes up about you know 500 megabytes, but stick that on a memory stick, hand it over to the customer, and now whatever application they've got, they want to feed that monitor or that television, I should say, they've now got the LUT to do it, and, and it's, it's, it's an impressive bit of software. Um, so, so I mean, you know, S- Steve has told me a few things about it, and I'm, and I'm hoping to catch up with him uh, in March and have lunch and talk a few more things with him about it. But one of the things he's pointed out a few times, I've read online is that some of the competing bits of software, I mean, Light Illusion, Light Space is not an, is not an inexpensive bit of software. It's £2,500. Um, but some of the competing products, uh, they take a different tack. When they're calibrating, when, when they're profiling a display, they, um, they, 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 they don't uh, do a read of every possible colour and then do the transform. What they do is they throw up a colour onto the display and they say, we want this to be this colour. And so they'll throw up you know, a certain colour of red with, with, with target values, uh, uh, and they'll see that it's not quite right, and then they'll take a guess at what it probably should be, throw that colour up, and then half the difference. And after three or four measurements, they know what values they have to throw up on the SDI output to get the right colour, and then they move on. Which means that every profiling operation takes three times as long, four times as long, so to build a 17-point LUT, you're not looking at an hour and a half. You're looking at the afternoon, you know, or overnight, you know. Um, and once you've built the LUT, 
you can't go back and reuse that profile data for other things. The, the nice thing about Lightspace is that once you've profiled the display, you can build LUTs for different environments. You can say, okay, I want to build it for Rec. 709 working, or I want to build it for the P3 uh, digital cinema color space. Um, that, that seems like a, a much nicer way of going about things, you know, much much more clever way of doing it. Fantastic. Very smart. So, you know, that this is... I never thought I'd be talking about um, building LUTs because I always kind of shied away from, um, you know, the way f the film boys use LUTs. And they typically come from the manufacturer of the film stock, you know, and they've assumed that you've got a working good properly calibrated display and here's your here's your LUT for Kodachrome whatever or or, uh -huh. or Fujinon stock whatever um, and off you go um, so I never thought I'd kind of get involved in that but actually there's this idea of having to use LUTs to tame high-end domestic displays into something that looks a bit more like a, a television display and uh, you know it requires a bit of investment it requires a probe that you can connect to a computer like a Klein uh, it requires a, 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 a patch generator and the nice thing about the Fuji patch generator is it's not it's not the most expensive one you can buy. It's about eight hundred pounds, but it as well as being a patch generator, it's a LUT as well. So basically, you, you generate you, you profile the display using the patch generator. You build the LUT, you load the LUT into the Fuji. Now you can test what you've done. Now you can confirm. Ah yes. You can reprofile the display with the LUT in the way, and, and you know just for the customer's confidence. So we're, we're, yeah, it's rather splendid. Um, as I say. Um, uh, uh, Lightspace um, Color Management System, Lightspace CMS, is is, is produced by uh, Light Illusion. Uh, their website is a fantastic resource. Lots and lots of, of of PDFs you can read. Lots and lots of of good information about profiling displays, integrating with um, uh, you know, other devices. So you know they they support lots and lots of uh, different um, uh, uh, you know probes. And patch generators and all those kind of things. Very, uh, very, very good, you know, um, company to do business with. It seems. Excellent. Yes, I have actually been to their site, and I did find there was, there was quite a lot of interesting resources just to gen up on, really. If, um... So increasingly, so for example, the Flanders monitors, the Flanders Scientific, which I think are brilliant monitors, um, mm. really very good. They use the same panels as the Sony. PVMs and BVM OLEDs. Okay, um, right. In fact, Flanders for a long time have been considered to be like very good LCDs, but they, in the last year or so, they've been doing OLEDs as well. They they come they come with with um, uh, you know LUTs on board, so so you know you could you can you load a LUT into your Flanders monitor, um, but uh, you know lots of things support uh, LUTs in in the many different formats. But uh, if you if you're going to be making them and managing them, you really do need something like Lightspace to do it. There are a shed load of kind of open source hacker type tools, you know, for manipulating LUTs. But, uh, you know, life's too short, you know, kind of pay the money, get the decent bit of software that does it all under in one in one interface rather than, you know, having half a dozen little bits of command line nonsense that allow you to, you know, scale a LUT for whatever purpose, you know. Phil, you're going to get post about that. <laughs> there will be... <laughs> Yes, no doubt. <laughs> there will be command line jockeys for whom that's, oh, oh, that's the wrong thing to say. Yeah, no, but I mean, if, you, if you're charging customers for this service, oh, you, you want to be slick and, and, and there and on the case, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to the, us, us pushing out our, our, our colorimetry offerings in, in this way. You know, it, it mm. seems like a good area to get into, particularly as you can't buy Viera plasmas anymore and people are increasingly wanting to use monitors, uh, televisions in the back of their grading rooms that, that require taming. Now, as a kind of a close-off, um, the, the, the colorist at Molinaire, uh, uh, you know, he was very sort of gracious with his time and, 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 and very helpful. Uh, but at the end, he said to me, he said, he said, he said, to be honest, if we could get a two thousand pound television to look exactly like a BVM, an eighteen thousand pound BVM, we probably wouldn't have bought an eighteen thousand pound BVM, would we? And I said, eh, you've hit, hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> Silk purses, Saudis, uh, you know. Yeah. You're having to work very hard to make something which looks almost as good as the thing you don't have to work very hard and you can rely on. Yeah. And that's, that's it, isn't it? But, uh, that's the nature of it. And for, for many people, they'll be using uh, much lesser monitoring. Uh, it's it's, to, it's about knowing the tool set in front of you, isn't it? Really? So not yeah, everybody's and... going to have access to the, to the grading skills or the grading equipment uh, or the display equipment that people at, at the very high-end post houses like Molly um, have. But if you know what you're not got, if you if you know what you haven't got, in a way you 
you're not fooling yourself into thinking that this is perfect. And for most, the vast majority of work, uh, just just you, you, you know setting the contrast at the midpoint so that it's kind of around about 80 or 100 candelas per meter squared at the white point setting the blacks using pluge and you, and you, and yeah. you get pluge on simpty bars you know it's in your final cut it's in your avid you know setting the pluge so that blacker than black is hidden and just grayer than black is only just visible and using the blue check on the front of your monitor to make sure that your 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 saturation is correct that gets your monitor 98% of the way there it really does um yeah. you know for the vast majority of editing uh, and 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 all those kind of things uh you know you don't need um uh, somebody like me showing up and billing you 150 pounds to 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 make your monitor a tiny bit less blue because you know you'll never see that and 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 you know for most work just using your eyes and a couple of test signals is all you need to do. I always tell editors that you know don't don't go to the expense of hiring me every few weeks. You know just just these are the things that matter. You know it's unlikely yeah. your monitor's drifting. You know when I first started in the eighties and, and and when yeah. I was you know when I was running engineering in in a couple of the facilities in Soho in the nineties when it was all still CRTs and particularly before Sony introduced beam landing for auto calibration in CRTs. Um, yeah. uh, it was definitely the case that we had to calibrate every single color display in a client facing room every day. So I started at eight in the morning and by 10 o'clock when the edits were starting, I know that every edit suite monitor, every graphic suite monitor had been calibrated. Uh, that's not the case anymore, you know. I go to channel five once every six months to do their monitors and they've barely moved, you know. Yeah, yeah, as you'd expect. Fascinating, Phil, absolutely fascinating. It's, and it's um, there's gonna be more of it. And so there you are. You've shed some light on a subject that saved a lot of red faces all around. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if the faces are red, clearly the monitor hasn't been calibrated properly. <laughs> oh, and we, and we haven't said anything about um, how the lighting in the room ch- uh, affects what you see. Um, uh, so. I, I think I'd, I'll refer you back to our first two podcasts because I think we talked a little bit, didn't we, about we did. about color perception and and, uh, and Russian speakers and and women who'd had red green colorblind children and right. all that good stuff you know uh, so there you go <laughs> lovely well thank you phil most interesting jolly really good. good i'll see you soon chap see you soon bye bye